Hi, and welcome to another Medical Director Minute. Today, we'll be talking about a subject that gives every medical director heartburn, the lift assist. Lift assists are a type of call that can lead to many difficulties in EMS care. I hope to convince you today that most of our lift assists are medical calls and should be treated as such. First, what constitutes a lift assist versus what is dispatched as a lift assist? An actual lift assist is where a party needs help moving from one place they intended to be to another site they also intended to be. On the other hand, if a complainant is found to have ended up on the ground, there is something that has affected their baseline safety or ability to perform activities of daily living. Also, these patients are at an increased risk of having chronic medical conditions that increase their risk of subtle but devastating illnesses. Lift assist patients tend to be older on multiple medications and have decreased mobility. These patients can be severely injured from an otherwise minor injury. They are at increased risk of fractures, internal bleeding, and sepsis from minor issues. These patients might also have a decreased ability to recognize changes such as low blood pressure or pain due to medications or other normal processes of aging. The list of cis patient may also have a fear of going to the hospital. They may have had family or friends that have gone to the hospital and never gone home. They may feel there is an increased risk of losing freedom or control over their mobility and decision-making. We need to acknowledge these are real possibilities. Patients that fall are at an increased risk of never returning home, but we want to make sure they can receive medical care early, which increases their chance of staying independent and reduces their possibility of long-term care needs. We need to be clear in articulating this as a possibility. Given that patients are at increased risk of poor outcomes, we should do everything to screen for those that might benefit from early interventions. With that being said, we put out a checklist that focuses on finding those risk factors. We are looking for alterations in vitals, mobility, and those at high risk of bleeds or injuries in this checklist. So when do you use the checklist? Well, to start, anytime a patient is found in a place they did not intend to be, next to the bed, a slip and fall while using a walker, or slipping out of a chair, we should move them to a position of comfort, take some vitals, including a blood pressure and heart rate, and make sure they can safely walk and transfer from the bed to chair. Be sure to check for any signs of injuries. Subtle injuries may include minor abrasions or bumps on the head, skin tears, swollen joints, or any pain. For those with decreased mobility, decreased sensory ability, or decreased cognitive ability, it's vital that we range all their joints. One of the best ways to test for a fractured hip is to log roll the legs. Make sure they can move their shoulders, elbows, wrists, and fingers without pain or grimacing. They should also be able to move their knees and ankles without difficulty. You should also check for any neck pain, making sure they can move their neck left and right to a 45 degree angle without any increase of pain or numbness. You should also check for any neck pain making sure they can move their neck left and right at a 45 degree angle without any increase in pain or numbness. Any new neurologic deficits should be documented and you should recommend the patient go to the emergency department. Patients on blood thinners, which includes aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, heparin, Lovenox, Xarelto, Eliquis, and Bradaxa, just to name a few, should be recommended to go to the emergency department, especially if they have any evidence of head injury or have a loss of consciousness. Patients are at an increased risk of head bleeds just if they're over 65. If patients meet any of the yeses on the checklist, you should encourage that they go to the emergency department. If they refuse, we need to figure out a couple things. First, why don't they want to go? This question helps us assess the cognitive ability and understands their capacity to make decisions. If they have a compelling reason, this suggests they have good capacity, though we might disagree. It also allows us to address their concerns in a meaningful way. Second, what is their plan to seek care if we were to leave them at home? This question allows us to assess their support system and their access to medical care. If they have a primary care doctor, we might suggest calling them and see if they can see them an appointment today. Or that doctor might actually help us convince them to go to the emergency department. If they lack access, it allows us to discuss the benefit of going to the emergency department to gain that access. Next, who's going to check on them? This question allows us to assess their support structure. Do they have family or friends that come by and check on them regularly? Do they have access to food? Are they able to take care of themselves? Or do they need a lot of assistance? Can those that provide care to the patient continue to do so? Or is that caregiver overwhelmed and outside their ability? And finally, can the patient call us back if they need to? If they were found on the ground and did not have a way to get to the phone and spend several hours there, we need to talk to them about ways they can get help. It may not be safe to leave them there without access. Once you've answered all these questions, it's time to call the medical director.
What's the reason for calling the medical director? Well, it's important for us to put another person on the line to discuss the risks and benefits with the patient. Having another provider talk with the patient lets us ensure the patient is fully informed by multiple people saying the same thing. Research has also shown that when patients talk to the medical director, who might say the same exact thing that you already said, the patient is more likely to go to the emergency department. When you call the medical director for a refusal, be sure to start with the question. Start with something like, I'm calling for a refusal for a lift assist with a positive finding on the checklist. You should then talk about your findings, including vitals and injuries, report what you have discussed with the patient, reasons they don't want to go, and other assessment findings such as support systems and safety. The medical director may request to talk with the patient or family member. Talking with the patient allows the medical director to assess and ensure the patient's capacity, decision-making ability, and safety. After talking with the medical director, it may be found that the patient has capacity, good decision-making ability, and a good strong support system. If this is the case, they will need to sign a refusal. After they sign a refusal, you need to be sure to document all your findings. You need to write down the discussion we had, including the risks and benefits and physical exam findings, their reasons for not wanting to go to the hospital, and what services were offered to them. Unfortunately, if the patient does not have the capacity to refuse, they cannot refuse care because they cannot understand the risks and benefits. In these instances, we are protected by implied consent. We are obligated to transport these patients even though they may voice not wanting to go. Falling under benevolence and justice, we are preventing further harm to the patient and acting in a manner that a reasonable person would want us to act at that time. Again, this action is for the patient's safety and well-being. If the patient lacks capacity, we will call for transport. Occasionally, if the patient is confused enough, they may require sedation to facilitate these means of safe transport. Again, this can be a difficult decision to make. However, involving medical direction is often helpful. Finally, before we leave the patient, we should do a cursory check of the house looking for signs of hazards and neglect. Most falls happen between the bathroom and the bedroom. Therefore, ensuring sufficient lighting, no trip hazards, and recommendations for supporting bars is well within our preview. The idea is to reduce the chance of falling. Patients that are on oxygen should use the least amount of tubing as possible to prevent tripping. Remove any throw rugs in the patient's pathway. Make sure they have easy access to their walker and other support devices. If the patient is 65 years or older and appears to have poor living conditions, we must call Adult Protective Services. These conditions might include poor hygiene, lack of food, no access to support services, or signs of neglect or abuse from the person responsible for giving that care. You must notify both your leadership and medical director as soon as possible of these cases. Notifying leadership allows us to follow up on the case and may assist with getting the patient the help they need to live safely. Thank you for taking the time to learn about how you can help prevent serious harm to patients at significant risk within our community. Please take some time to review the Lift Assist checklist. This has been another Medical Director Minute. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with all your EMS and firefighting friends. Until next time, please stay safe out there. Have fun doing what you do best, providing the best care possible.